Good evening, and welcome to a conversation with Raymond Johnson. Uh, this event is part of the Black at Rice series, which is hosted by the Rice Task Force on Slavery, Segregation, and Racial Injustice. My name is Akila Mance, and I am a Rice alum, class of 2005. I am joined here tonight um, also by Dr. Alex Bird, who is a Rice alum, class of 1990. We are both uh, members of the task force, and we are here to host this conversation with uh, Raymond Johnson, class of 1969. I will defer the introduction of our esteemed um, special guest this evening, because that's what we're here to talk about. Um, and I do want to just remind you and let you know that throughout this evening, you are able to send questions to us through the Q&A box. And we will um, address those at the end of our talk this evening and get to as many as possible. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Bird to get our conversation started for this evening. Thanks so much, Akila, and it's a great honor to um, be with you here tonight, Dr. Johnson. Um, Akila and I have a, a set of questions that basically move chronologically, and and we'll um, go go back and forth with them. I'm I'm, go I'm going to start with a, a question about your early life, um, your early education. Um, was in the public schools of Alice, Texas, uh, when, when those schools were segregated. Um, would you talk some about your education in Black schools and later in desegregated schools and, and how those experiences prepared you for the next steps in your educational journey at the University of Texas and later at Rice? Okay, so yeah, my life was always somewhat unconventional. My step-grandfather taught me to read when I was very young. So when I went to the two-room schoolhouse, Carver Elementary, uh, they saw I could read, and so they skipped me two grades. I started in third grade. And so I stayed two grades ahead throughout the time I was in the school. And actually, that until eighth grade, uh, we had eight grades in the Carver Elementary School. At grade nine, we would get bused to Kingsville, which is a 28 mile bus ride. But fortunately, Brown versus Board was decided the year before I had to take the bus ride. So instead I went to the DuBose Junior High School in Alice. So that's my first integration experience. Now, I don't remember that much about the integration experience. I do remember that they discovered I couldn't see. So that's when I got glasses. Then I went off to high school and high school was also pretty unremarkable except when it came time to graduate, I took the national merit test the year before, the SAT, and I didn't do very well. I did well, but not well enough to get a scholarship. So my counselor, Stan Brooks, said, why don't you stay an extra year? I would just be giving back one of my two years, and you can see if you can do better on the SAT and maybe get a scholarship. I did, and I did. So that's how I got a national merit scholarship to the University of Texas. Now, when I was in Alice, my main teacher was Mr. Larry O'Rear, who was a math teacher. And he put me in touch with Howard Curtis, who was his master's advisor at the University of Texas. So that's how I got from Alice to the University of Texas and to H.B. Curtis as a mentor who plays a role in Rice because Dr. Curtis was a Rice grad. Can we can we talk a, a, a little bit about um, Texas, U, the University of Texas? University which, of okay. yes, which which um, in in many ways I guess clearly wasn't um, built for black students, even though black students had had, had been were, were there when you when when you arrived. Um, I'm. I, and and I wonder if you could talk some about where did you find and cultivate. Um, belonging, a sense of belonging and community um, on campus and beyond socially, but also um, intellectually uh, as, as a way of giving us a sense to, to what and to whom um, you, you owe some of your success and preparation 
um, for okay, your yeah. okay. next steps? That's an interesting question because the, so the social and the intellectual was sort of two different parts. Socially, it was easy because the dorms were still segregated. So I lived in an all-black dorm. Now, there were two all-black dorms on campus. One was for middle-class folks and one was for poor folks like me. I was in the poor folks dorm. But, you know, it was great. I mean, you know, we, we lived together. Uh, everything happened after the school. You came back to the dorm and you were in a very friendly environment. And the women also lived in segregated dorms on the other side of campus. So we had to walk over campus to dances and things of that type. Uh, intellectually, it's interesting because Texas was, there was applied math and there was pure math. They called it third floor and fourth floor. Now the pure math, which I think was the third floor, no, there was the fourth floor, was headed by Robert E. Lee Moore. And that sort of tells you all you need to know about him. Uh, he was a staunch racist, okay? Uh, one of my friends who was black went to him and wanted to take one of his courses. And Moore told him, listen, the guy told me this, Moore told him, you're welcome to take my course. Your grade will start at a C and can only go down from there. So I didn't try to take any courses with Moore. I was fourth floor, Dr. Curtis, applied math. And, you know, we sort of got forced together. I mean, most of Moore's students won the contests and, you know, did everything else in Texas. But the third floor group, and there was a young man named Gentry Lee, he and I, you know, we competed in the contest, but of course we got beat. Uh, the board students always won. But, you know, he and I, you know, did have a very nice relationship when I was a, a, a student. So that's the intellectual side. The, the, the social side was easy because we were in an all black dorm in an all black environment. Well, I know, I know that there, um, what one of, one of the recent questions about Texas is one of their classroom buildings was was yep. named after after Dr. Moore. And they decided to change it. I was really surprised. Yeah. But 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 very pleased. Oh, and I should have mentioned also, so uh, uh, Dr. Curtis, you know, he gave me a um, directed reading course for the first two years. I started taking classes and I started uh, I took my first calculus was a reading course with him. And then I went into the regular courses at the university. And so, you know, but then he would also guide me in terms of who I should take courses with and things like that. And then he was also the one who, first of all, was probably the first person that ever mentioned the word graduate school to me. And then uh, after he told me about graduate school, he mentioned that Rice was planning to desegregate and that he was gonna be coming to Rice as a, um, on, on a sabbatical. So he'd be there. And that was the, one of the main reasons I did decide to come to Rice. He was here. It's, it's, it's interesting, or it's just, it's, it's something to, to, to keep in mind that, that dur during this age, there are, there, there are, there, there are mentors, um, uh, there are black and white mentors in, in, in your, in your life that are, that are um, helping to, to lead you along. And you should, you know, you should bear some things in mind, like, for example, if there's a very good documentary, which I, I forgot the name of, but it's on Jim Allison, who got the Nobel Prize in chemistry or medicine about two years ago. He's from Alice. I was in a class with his brother. And there's a film on PBS that talks about his life. He had a totally different experience with Mr. O'Rear. Mr. O'Rear was the head of the whole science program. Now I was a math student, I was only taking math. But he was also the head of the science program. And Jim Allison went to him and said, you know, he wanted to take a biology class and would they be taking, talking about evolution? And Mr. O'Rear told him not on his life would he ever be talking about evolution. He was a fundamentalist Christian. He didn't believe in evolution. He didn't teach evolution. Fortunately, there's no evolutionary theory of mathematics and I was fine, but you know, I was just amazed at what a different experience we had with the same person. Dr. Johnson, you talked a little bit about your um, educational upbringing back in Alice. And, um, you know, it's interesting. You came from an all-Black public school, which was legally mandated at the time. But um, Alex and I both have a similar background, him going to the esteemed Yates 
uh, high school and I uh, went to Lithonia High School out uh, in Georgia. But I, I wonder in that experience, how important did you think it was to have teachers and educators who look like you to sort of build that foundation and support you and give you that confidence about being able to go on to a place like UT or Rice? Well, well you know, I mean, I, I don't think about it that much, but you know, I think it was actually critical because when I left Alice, I had no doubt that I could compete with anybody anywhere. And, you know, I've always felt that all my life. And I met a lot of people who, when they finished their elementary school or high school experience, didn't have the same effect on them. So I was very lucky. The teachers, Ms. Dukes and Ms. Wilson, were very supportive. I mean, you know, they decided to put this little kid who didn't know anything into third grade, which in a sense changed my life completely because that's what made it possible for me to get a scholarship and go to college. I couldn't have afforded it. My family definitely could not have afforded college. I needed a scholarship. Well, we're, we're transitioning now from um, early uh, life to a, a series of questions that um, Akila has um, about your time at, at Rice. Okay, Akila, I will warn you, I've already told Alex, I think what I knew and what was actually going on may be completely different things. I mean, I was a graduate student, okay? I was the point of the sphere. I was not making any policy or making any decisions. And I've read, Russell Barnes gave me when I was visiting at Rice, a copy of the student's thesis about the decision to desegregate. And uh, there were some people who were not very happy about me or about having a black student on campus. We, we definitely will um, kind of get into all those different issues. Um, I think, you know, one question that you always hear when you talk to Rice alums is, you know, why Rice? So, you know, being from Texas was Rice on your radar early on and so, so you must remember, graduate school wasn't on my radar early on, okay? Nothing was on my radar until Dr. Curtis mentioned it. So, no, I wasn't even aware of Rice, as far as I recall, because I wasn't aware of anything after. I mean, first you had to graduate. And so my, my job was to graduate first, and then uh, I learned about Rice. Uh, a friend of mine named Howard Jefferson, I, I, I don't recall, but I got an invitation to come visit Rice. And so his, this friend, Howard Jefferson, was looking for a job in Houston. So we drove down to Houston. I remember just the long drive. And then I don't remember a thing about visiting Rice. But I do remember the party at TSU the evening after the visit because uh, it was very noisy and very smoky. But, you know, it was, it was very nice. And then we went back to Austin and I decided to come to Rice. So I did visit but I don't remember the visit at all. So when you were um, at UT and, and considering grad school at that time, um, did you have your mindset on coming to Rice or were you still considering a couple of other options? So I, I did consider other options very briefly. I mean, uh, to me, the decisive fact was the fact that Dr. Curtis was going to be here. I felt like having somebody that I knew, you know, at least available to talk to would be helpful. Uh, I remember considering the University of Chicago. I remember being a little concerned because I had Alice to Austin and then Austin to Chicago was a bit of a big leap. So I thought Austin to Houston was probably more manageable than Austin to Chicago. So I believe you mentioned a little bit earlier that, uh, was it Dr. Curtis who informed you that yeah. Rice was intending to desegregate? Yes. Um, kind of based on what you had heard from him at the time, did you feel like Rice was you know, ready and willing and gonna be open and welcoming <laughs> when you first got here? Uh, since he suggested it, I guess I didn't think very much about it. I mean, if, you know, I mean, I thought he knew me very well. And of course, I thought he knew Rice very well because he had been a student here. So I just really didn't have any questions. And, and after I did, did the campus visit, 
Um, again, I don't remember the visit at all, but I remember being convinced, okay, I should do this. This is definitely something worth doing. So when you arrived um, at Rice, at that point, the board has already passed its resolution to desegregate. Um, is that correct? By the time you got here? As I understand it, yes. Okay. And so when you arrived here on campus, what was sort of your first impression of the math department um, and, and where you were going to spend the next you know, few years? So that's, it's, you have to understand the context. Remember, I came from the University of Texas, which Heem and Sweat had to sue to get into. So I was coming to a university that had chosen to desegregate. Now, I didn't know all the reasons. I mean, I've learned that later, but you know, that's one big difference. Second thing, remember, I was in a segregated dorm at the University of Texas. When I came to Rice, the first years were given a room in a dorm on campus and we were studying math. Uh, we were going to take a uh, reading course in analysis that was going to be taught by one, um, who was going to be supervised by one of the Rice professors. So here's second big change. All of a sudden, I was in a segregated dorm, and now I'm living in a dorm, a real, actual dorm. Now, we didn't stay there long because they encouraged us to get roommates. And so shortly after I got here, two of one second year student, Jeff Lewis, first year student Bob Boner and I got an apartment. And so uh, we, we moved out of the dorm and into the apartment. But I guess my feeling was Rice was more ready because first of all, I mean, I had roommates, I'd had a dorm room and I didn't have to sue to get in. So it, it seemed to look quite a bit different than the University of Texas. Now you, had you know, spent a lot of your time being one of the first already up to that point, being one of the only, you know, um, kind of along the way. When you came into the math department at Rice, being you know the only student of color at the time, did that feel isolating at all, or were you? I know math brains get to math, and a lot of times you can just focus um, on the academics. But how how did that feel? Well. Okay, so yeah, I, I will mention a small story which has been in my mind for some reason that I don't know, okay? But, uh, you know, Hank Aaron, who holds the record for home runs, when he was a minor league player in Mobile, he was batting. And the catcher was trying to get on his nerves, and so he told him, hey, Hank, you notice your label's not up. And you're supposed to hold the label up because then you won't break the bat when you hit it. And Hank Aaron supposed to look down at him and said, I didn't come here to read. And so I guess that's how I felt about Rice, I came to study, but the math department was a very congenial place. I mean, I would, every time I would go to Sammy's, it would usually be with a group. We played touch football together, not very well, but we tried. Um, we had actually a very good football player who wouldn't play with us. Now, that's not because we were so good. It was because I think his contract in the NFL wouldn't let him, Frank Ryan. Um, but you know, the, the math, I, I wasn't on campus. I was in the math department and the math department was very welcoming, very friendly, and just a wonderful place to be. When, uh, you may not recall when, but do you recall how you found out about um, there being an issue with the lawsuit? Yeah, no, you know, I tried to figure that out and I really can't. When I came, I was expecting to be a student, a graduate assistant. At some point in the fall, Jim Douglas told me about the suit and said that I was going to be a research associate. Now, I don't remember when. I just remember, I think it was sometime in September, probably before classes start. I was told that as a research associate, an employee, I could take classes so I could do all the stuff I was going to do as a student anyway. And that was... Uh, you know, but I did learn about the suit because I wondered sometimes, you know, why did I stay here given that there was a suit? But I did have a plan B. And plan B was that I applied to the National Science Foundation for a graduate fellowship. And I figured if I got the graduate fellowship and Rice won the suit, I could keep the graduate fellowship at Rice. But if Rice lost the suit, I could go anywhere. 
And I got the graduate fellowship and Rice won the suit. So I used the fellowship here at Rice. You know, we've had this conversation a little bit before about the lawsuit. And I wonder from just a personal perspective, how, how did it feel to sort of have, you know, this, um, your, your next level of your career starting, um, you're excited to be here. You believe that Rice is ready and willing to have you there. And then to have a, you know, a group of alumni for whatever reasons say, we don't think he should be here. Um, you know, what was, what was that like? So I guess the thing is, you must remember, again, I came from the University of Texas, so I wasn't surprised. I mean, I guess I sort of felt like this was par for the course. Um, I, I didn't, I, I think it was uh, awkward in the sense that, you know, I knew that non-citizens of Texas had been coming for a long time. I knew the tuition had been raised without that much of a fuss. So as I mentioned to you, I thought it was always about race. And uh, I, I don't know to this day why I was so confident that Rice was gonna win, but I think it's because of the civil rights era. And you just felt like there's no way they can lose this. So I expected it. I thought Rice was gonna win. And then eventually I was told that they had won. Now, I didn't hear about all the appeals and stuff like that. So that may have, if I had learned that, that might have changed some of my way of thinking. But um, I was just very confident they were gonna win the suit. So there are actually two letters that I have heard about, I've, I've read that appear to be from you <laughs> to uh, President Pitzer at the time um, about certain issues that were going on. And I wanted to ask you about those. Um, the first one, which uh, sort of, I guess, talked to the president about you know, what are you going to do to prepare for the two uh, undergraduate students, African-American students who were going to come the year after you? Um, and so I wonder, you know, kind of what was was going through your mind there, even if you don't remember uh, the, the details around it. Um, what made you do that? Yeah, you know, I don't remember the details around it. Uh, my son has copies of, you know, some earlier drafts of the letters. I have to think that probably my wife has something to do with it. Uh, she didn't, she was, I mean, so, okay. So I came in 63. I met her in 64. We got married in 65. And I don't know when the letters were written for one thing, but I do know that she had gone to a tea that Mrs. Pitzer had for, I don't, again, I don't know if it was faculty and graduate students or just for graduate students, but there was a tea and she had a, okay experience. It wasn't that bad. But, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if after that, uh, seeing herself as the only person in the room, she had suggested that uh, we might write a letter and see what they were going to do about getting some more of us around. I don't, but other than that, I don't remember the details. So, so I am so encouraged to, to, to hear some of this because um, Caleb McDaniel and I, who who host a, a, a weekly webinar, a doc talk, a document talk about some of the work of the task force on slavery, segregation and racial injustice have, have puzzled over an earlier letter um, that, that you wrote to the, the president right uh, after the, the appeal had basically been settled. And uh, it's, a, it's a phenomenal letter from the perspective of some, a citizen of the university, right? Considering universities in the 1960s, because it's this very, it's this very confident and straightforward um, communication, um, asking for a certain account of, a certain amount of accountability uh, from the president of the university with, with, as it concerns making space for black students on campus and, 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 and helping them to know that, um, that the, the, the rules have changed, but, but also that there, there are gonna be scholarships. You're raising the question of whether, unless, uh, unless word gets out to the, in black communities that there are scholarships to Rice, 
um, then a lot of black students probably won't apply. That's, that's the argument in the letter. Um, and you're in, in the way that people used to type letters, um, well, your are. initials are on the bottom as the writer of the letter, but then there are three other initials as the, as the typist. Uh, and one of the things we talked about in that doc talk is the degree to which this letter absolutely represents your position, but does it also represent a community position? Is it drafted in tandem with, with folks in the community? And so I'm really heartened um, to hear you talk some about that process. Do you, do you know who the other, what the other initials were? Because again, I get I, I should have, I should have the letter on screen. Um, and if you, if you give me a moment, if okay. um, uh, Akila um, continues, I'll, I'll, I'll call up, I'll, I'll call up that, that letter. Okay. And look, look how fast I've called it up. Okay. Actually, someone has messaged me with the initials. It too. It's CS. <laughs> Have it. The initials are CS. That's undoubtedly Claudette Smith, my wife. Okay. So there we go. There we go. And We're breaking the news. Ver the version that I have that my son has is handwritten. So I don't know who typed it, but the one that I had a copy of was handwritten. Well, we, and, and we wouldn't mind having a copy of that handwritten letter. So we'll, when the webinar is over, we'll try to arrange okay. that as well. Yeah, my son can do that. He, I think he has even two copies of it. So, you know, again, I think that was definitely my wife. So, so looking in that um, letter, I, there are a few things that stood out. And this is sort of the, the second one that we do have the copy of, which um talks a little bit more about yeah i guess the nice way to say it is a little bit of calling rice out <laughs> in the sense of on one hand being proactive and in, yes initiating the lawsuit and um you know welcoming you here to campus but on the other hand um i believe at the same time you address them um not really wanting to publicize your admission and then, um, you know, sort of going back and telling uh, students not to invite a uh, black student to Rondelay. Um, I believe you also uh, mentioned them not really trying to talk about or publicize a scheduled visit of NAACP leader and civil rights activist Roy Wilkins. And so there was a lot of um, sort of talk about, you know, hey, are you all <laughs> talking out of both Serious? sides? Yes. <laughs> well, again, you know, I don't remember the second letter. I'm not sure. Maybe my son has copies of the, the first two letters. But I think everything is informed by my experience at Texas. OK, we had not been welcomed to Texas. And I guess I probably had bigger hopes at Rice that we were going to be welcomed. The suit was the first indication that, well, it's not exactly going to go like you thought. It's going to be more like Texas. And so I would, it, if I had to guess, it was just reflecting on how it had started like it was going in one direction, but it really looked like we were going in the same direction as Texas. It's interesting in um, sort of rereading that and, and talking to you uh, here this evening. I, I see your letters and, um, you know, the conversations that you're having with the administration advocating for um, not only yourself, but other students um, of color to come. And it makes me think about our current students as well, who are engaged in this sort of same conversation of, um, you know, expressing their voice, their opinions to administration and to the rights community as a whole, um, you know, based on their lived experience, do you have any um, maybe words of advice or <laughs> encouragement for those students who are also just trying to find a way to um, express um, their concerns while at Rice? So I, I think they should do exactly what I do. You know, you use your, your experience as the basis for what you see in front of you and, you know, what you think should happen. And then you speak on the basis of that. I mean, I, I had a, 
unfortunate, a, a good experience at Texas in some ways, but a very bad experience in other ways. And I was really concerned that Rice was not prepared for the black students who were going to come and they were going to have the same kind of experience at Rice that I had at Texas. Well, and, and that, that concern that is, is, is evident uh, in, in your early letters is, is also, I just want everyone to know that it, it remains um, quite evident in, in communications with you, with, with you now and, and how careful that you ask all of us to be who are talking about uh, the, 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 the first black students at, at, at Rice. Um, to make sure and, and speak of them in, in plural, re regardless of what year any, any student came. And, and, and I, take, I take that advice that you, that you give us um, very seriously, that you want us to, co to consider the undergraduate students and, and your arrival at the university as, as one of a piece, as a, as a community of folks who, who arrive in, in, in short order and, and, and should be um, treated um, together as, as we're considering the Black experience yes, on exactly. campus. Can I say, because I mean, one of the things that I thought they had a much more difficult time than I did, they were living on campus, they were living in the dorms, and I hope they had a good experience. I was in Third Ward, I was in the Black community. I was at Rice, eight o'clock in the morning till five o'clock in the evening, and then I was in Third Ward. And so, you know, it was just, I was in a supportive environment by night, by day, I was on campus. I was in a supportive environment because I was in the math department. But, you know, I really think the only difference between me and the first two undergraduates is that they were in the dorms and I have no idea what they went through in the dorms. This, this may be a good moment to, to shift to our, uh, our, our next series of questions that are about Houston and, and your life and your life in Houston and you've teed it up um, perfectly. You, you've already indicated to us that like most graduate students, um, you lived in Houston. And I'm, we're, we're curious about what the city and, and Third Ward in particular was like for you, especially um, living in this town as it, as it was moving through its own civil rights movement. Um, we, we know that Black community was important to you and Alice um, and at the University of Texas. Um, could, you, could you talk some more to us, uh, talk a, a bit more about um, community in Houston and your life in, in Third Ward? So can I I'll start by saying a very good word about my two roommates? So, you know, they were roommates for a very short period of time. Bob Boner and Jeff Lewis. I'm still in touch with Jeff. Bob died, unfortunately, a few years ago. But, you know, if it wasn't for Jeff, I might very well have left Rice. So Rice at those days had a, a pretty unusual grading system, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with. But I took my first exam and I got a one. And I remember coming back to the, the room with Jeff and said, Jeff, I've gotten some bad grades in my life, but I never got a one. He said, oh, at Rice, one is an A, two is a B, three is a C. I mean, <laughs> I was devastated when I saw that one. But, you know, he explained it to me. He didn't have to. If he had not wanted me to be there, he could have very easily have arranged it that day. But, you know, so we start out living in this apartment together. I have no idea how they got the apartment. I don't remember whether I went with them or not. I told you the story, I'm sure you heard about me becoming a Hindu Puerto Rican because the manager said that one of them said that I was a Hindu and one of them said I was a Puerto Rican when they asked us to leave. And so I did leave. And then my friend Howard Jefferson, who taught you at Yates, I think, had, uh, he, he, had, he was the one that was a precipitating factor in us getting kicked out because he used to just come over and sometimes he'd fix dinner with us and sometimes we'd go out to eat. He and I would go out to eat. And that's when they decided that I was black and I had to leave. So he and I got a room together in South McGregor and we stayed together until I got married. We, you know, we moved from various apartments. But, you know, we went out to eat uh, real food, not cafeteria food. I mean, a sandwich was OK, but, you know, I could get real meals when I was with, living with Jeff and when I was out in Third Ward. We had a lot of adventures in Third Ward. 
Uh, one of them I remember very well was uh, we went to a place on Dowling. The food was very good. The service was not so good. So Jeff had a bright idea. He decided to leave the waitress a 10 cent tip. <laughs> and the tip should have been much bigger than that. And I remember we were walking out to the car and the waitress came running out, Mr. Mr. You forgot your dime. <laughs> so, you know, we, we had uh, just normal life in third ward, which was, uh, so there was, uh, after I got married, my wife worked at the federal building. Cassius Clay was on trial. And so she was down there every day. She was able to watch, you know, I mean, not she, she had to work so she could go to trial, but she saw the comings and goings. And she came home one day and told me very proudly that Cassius Clay had looked at her and said, hello, beautiful woman, you know, beautiful lady. So she remembered that incident. Uh, we, we went through some sit-ins, not sit-ins, uh, picketing in Houston. She took me. Um, so all that was going on. In fact, I, I think, again, I, I've told the story that I met her because one of the Rice students, uh, did, okay, this open accommodations law had been passed. And theoretically, restaurants were open independent of race. But a Rice student decided to test that that was really true. So she organized a group of Rice students and a group of TSU students, and we would pair up and we'd go to a restaurant and see if we would get served. Now, Jeff Lewis, who was my former roommate, invited me to participate. And Claudette was one of the participants from uh, uh, TSU. And we almost invariably got kicked out of the restaurants. I mean, I don't think we ate at a single restaurant. So it was easy on the pocketbook, but uh, it was not so good in terms of whether Houston was living up to the open accommodations law. But on the other hand, I met my wife, so I can't be too unhappy about it. So that, that's kind of some of the things that were going on. Oh, I also remember that the, I saw Martin Luther King speak only once, and that was at TSU. We went over to TSU to hear him speak. And in terms of, you know, it, it, I was thinking about that. There really weren't that many activities that we or I participated in at Rice. I can only recall two. Uh, one was there was a, the speaker of the California House, Jesse Unruh. He was called Big Daddy Unruh. He gave a talk in one of the colleges. And so Claudette and I went over to that. And there was no problem. We enjoyed the talk. We even got to shake his hand afterwards. And so that went very well. The other incident on campus didn't go so well. Uh, you know, the Southwest Conference at that point had a gentleman's agreement that there were no black players. So my friend, too, who was uh, my son's godfather, he was, he was a genuinely smart, wonderful person. He got two tickets to a Rice basketball game. And he invited me to come with him. So we went to this game and Rice was playing Idaho State. Idaho State had a great black player named Ron Boone. I mean, he was, probably wasn't that good, but he was so much better than the Rice players. And I <laughs> outraged too, because I sat there and rooted for Idaho State. <laughs> he, how can you take my free ticket <laughs> and root for Idaho State? But I had, I had no choice. I really felt like I had to. And I think Idaho State won, by the way. I didn't go to any football games, and, and I really don't remember doing that many activities on campus. Most of the activities were things like the Martin Luther King speech in, in, at TSU. You, you've mentioned some of your interactions on the, the sort of main, one of the main streets in, in, in Third Ward on, on Dowling. Um, did you, um, how did um, Texas Southern University figure or, or, and did it in your life and experience while, while you were living in Houston? So, you know, again, the, the first, first day I was in Houston, I went to a party at TSU. Now, when I came back as a student, I really didn't have that much activity at TSU. But then when I met Claudette and married her, then there were a lot more activities. I mean, because I would go over there for any activities uh, she was having. So the TSU was important in the sense that in particular it was important for her. And so that was, you know, it, its connection to me. Now, actually, but I don't remember doing that many things at TSU because we got married after she graduated. And so really, you know, I mean, if, if she got an invitation to something as an alumni, then we would go back. But I, I don't remember doing a lot of things. I do remember the Martin Luther King speech when she was still a student. You, you've mentioned um, the, the ways in which you um, participated in, in some of the, what, what we've come to understand as the iconic activities 
of, of the civil rights movement, um, picketing, um, a, a certain uh, awareness uh, about how to how to speak to power in, in order to get um, in order to improve the situation for for black people in the communities that you that that you belong to. Um, could could you talk some about how you understood your work in the context of the moment? How did you under I, I imagine most of your days were filled with math. Yeah. And and I and, and I'm I'm just curious to to hear whether you 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 saw that work in the context of the moment, the or, or whether you you saw it um, maybe saw it separate from the moment or or somewhere in between. I think it's somewhere in between because again, you know, a, a lot of my memories from Rice are, st- are primarily related around work. I mean, you know, the uh, going to Sammy's, going to the Carol's to work in the library. Uh, I heard about President Kennedy's assassination when we were playing touch football. The Rice uh, graduate students, not very well, but we were playing touch football. So th- I didn't have a sense. I mean, I was there to get a degree. I had no idea what I would do when I got a degree. And in fact, uh, when, I, when Douglas left and we went to Chicago and I finally was going to get a degree, I was really enjoying being a graduate student. And he came to me one day because uh, he was new at Texas. I mean, I'm sorry, he was new at Chicago. And he didn't know a lot of the people yet. So he'd come up there sometime and talk to his two graduate students who had an office together. And he came to me one time and said, uh, don't you think you should graduate? It actually didn't seem like a great idea to me. <laughs> I mean, Chicago is wonderful, but he was right. And so, you know, I did start to buckle down and try to write a thesis. Uh, and so I graduated, but, you know, I guess I was focused on graduating and I had no idea what graduating meant even. Can we talk just for a minute about, um, about Chicago? So your, your, your PhD advisor, Dr. Douglas leaves Rice um, for the University of Chicago in, in, in 1967 and 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 you go with them, um, and this in in many ways it's got to be a very different place as you've already alluded, right? You've 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 gone to places that um, whose whose history of of educating um, blacks is relatively recent, right? You show up at UT when um, African Americans haven't been there very long. You're the you're the first black student at, at Rice, and and then you head to Chicago, which has a has has had a longer history uh, of, of having um, black students. And I'm, I'm curious how your, d- does your experience in Chicago or did it cast your Texas experience and your Rice experience in, in, different, in different lights? Did, did moving um, up north to the, to the, to the Midwest, did it, did it change the way you felt about Texas and, and Rice? I don't think so because you know one of the one of my earliest memories in Chicago. There was something in Chicago called the Wall of Respect. It was a mural that had been painted on a building in Chicago by black artists. And I remember my wife and I got a taxi and we went up there to look at it. You know, and and of course it was it was awesome to see it. I mean, we took some pictures of it and. Um, I remember the taxi driver telling us, uh, you really shouldn't be in this neighborhood, you know. And so, you know, we got in the taxi and we went back to the university, to the dorm at the University of Chicago. Um, I guess I was, I was just a visitor in Chicago. The math department was my home. I mentioned Douglas had another, he got another graduate student named Harold Meyer and he and I shared an office together. So, you know, it didn't really because to me, it was a lot like Rice in the sense that I'm in the math department and the only difference is I can go out and go to a restaurant if I can afford it. I can uh, do anything that normal people can do without thinking about it. I mean, I was still in the ghetto, by the way, because um, the south side of Chicago, just our apartment was just on the edge of it. But, you know, our interact, the universe was buying up all the properties. And so there weren't that many black people around us. Everybody was being bought up and, and they were being converted into university buildings. 
So I guess I was less in the black community in Chicago, but on the other hand, I had more freedom. And my wife had a very good job downtown. We had a subway that we could use, which we didn't have in Houston. We didn't have a car in Houston or in Chicago, but it was a lot easier to get around Chicago. So Chicago was, was wonderful. I guess I didn't think of Houston as not being wonderful. It was just that it was different. Thanks, thanks for that. I think one of the things that's be becoming clear is the, that uh, a, a graduate student experience is a, is a, is a, a quite particular, has particular kind of demands and is a, is a, certain, kind of, a certain kind of life. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is a closed environment. You know, the math department at Rice typically had five or six students a year so you're talking about a very small number of students. Now I have to mention that, uh, you know, because one of the things that I do find the most remarkable is not that I was the first African-American to get a PhD from Rice in math, it's that I was the last African-American to get a PhD from Rice in math. And this has been over 50 years. It's, it's, it, I think it's understandable when you look at it because Jim Douglas was an applied mathematician and the CAM, Center for Computational and Applied Mathematics, has had a lot of African-American students. So if I had been a current student, I probably would have been a CAM student and then probably makes more sense. But at the time, there was just this one math department. And so I was in the math department. I have no idea. I've often wondered why Jim left, why he decided to give up on Rice. Uh, shortly before, well, you know, Alex, uh, Graduate students have this particular kind of sense of humor. And Rice was primarily a place with analysis and applied math. And they didn't have much algebra. So they finally hired an algebraist about a year before I graduated, named Eldon Dyer from the University of Chicago. And he was driving to Rice and he had an automobile accident in Tulsa and was killed. And so the graduate students immediately said, the closest Rice ever came to an algebraist was Tulsa. <laughs> That's the kind of way you thought of thought about stuff like that, but you know it, it was it was uh, it it's different. It's a unique kind of experience because it's such a closed cocoon and you live in it all the time. You you you've you you've raised you've you've given us two ways to look at a very in, important question and pressing right. This, this issue of being the, the, the first and the last uh, black PhD student in the math department is, is, is something that I, I, I think we all successful, need to- Successful, I, I don't know if there've been any other students. I'm the last one to get a PhD, okay? It, it's, it, it's something to, to sit with and, and yeah. I hope we, we, we all sit with it for a while in, and, and look at it as well in, in given the explanation, like you've also said, there's a way to understand it, but it doesn't, I don't think it makes it any less pressing. And you, you must remember that when, when I came back as a faculty member, I mean, I was on the graduate committee. And so I did work very hard to try to see if we could find, you know, an African-American student to, for the mathematics department. I mean, I was, I was in the math department, not in CAM. And, you know, we came close, uh, but again, the small class size, in fact, there's only five or six positions every year. And then it was just, I wasn't in a position to sort of go out and cultivate the students, you know, to make sure they got the preparation that they wanted for Rice students, and that the students would be someone who would be interested in Rice. So I don't know what happened, like I said, and I don't know why Jim Douglas decided to leave. I sometimes think that perhaps it was the fact that there was going to be this applied math department, and I don't know if you agree with it or not, that's above my pay grade, but it is a fact. I, I just, I, I find it very curious. Well, I know, I know we're about to shift gears in a, in a right now and, and talk some about your experience at, at, at Maryland and, and also some of your very important work um, mentoring and, and, and producing um, math, math students there. And so I think this is a, it's a perfect time to, to head in that direction. That's actually a, a great segue um, into our next conversation. But before we go there, <laughs> I did want to sort of highlight uh, a comment that you made a few moments ago about 
your um, experience in, in Third Ward and TSU. And I think, um, you know, since we're talking about being Black at Rice and the Black experience at Rice, I think it's really important to highlight that um, something really important about that experience, at least as I understand it and many of my colleagues who've gone through Rice, is that um, not only do you need the support system on campus with the friends and faculty, but there's something about being a Black student at Rice um, and needing that Houston Black community to be able to go to and find um, support and find, uh, you know, things that you like to do. You know, Alex, I don't know. I mean, you, you're in a very unique position, Alex, in that, um, you know, not only did you attend Rice, but you're from Houston, you're from the Third Ward. I mean, has that been your experience as well? Does that cut across decades and graduate, undergraduate experience, uh, in your opinion? So I'm I'm from the north side actually. I just want to get that in now. Oh, Russian that's say, but I I'm, yeah, but I graduated. I, yeah, sorry. I just get crazy. No, I, I just want to put that out there that my third ward um, bona fides um, exist, but they're not. They're um, they're, they're folks with with better ones. I, I mean, so I, but I did graduate from from Yates High School, and and the the, the nearness of Yates and the nearness of Third Ward was was critical. In, in, in my time at Rice. So, so being able to um, head, head over to Miss Helen's shop and get my hair cut um, every uh, week or every couple of weeks and, and, and also to be able to continue to work at, at Yates um, were, were things that definitely um, in, improved and enriched my, my, my Rice experience. Yeah, can I say I had exactly the same experience because, you know, again, that's one of the fundamental problems is a haircut. And I found a barber in Third Ward and, you know, every couple of weeks or so, I'm on a bus headed into the Third Ward to get my haircut. The most remarkable thing is that when I came back to Houston 40 years later, I still had the same problem of getting a haircut and went and found a barber. And he had worked with my barber when I was a student at Rice. So he knew him. And, you know, it was, it, they were just across what I did was when I was looking for a haircut, I went back to the same place I had gone as a student. And of course, it wasn't there anymore because the city changes so much. But there was a place not that far from it. And the barber who worked there was someone who had worked with my barber back in the 40 years ago. So it, it really does help to have a community to latch on to. That was the key to my success in Maryland. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that you know, it's always a challenge when you're at a, you know, predominantly, you know, white institution like Rice, um, you're going to be able to build some community on campus, but you're never going to be able to have, you know, just that huge group of folks like you might have at an HBCU, obviously, right? And I think the Houston community is such a huge asset to the university um, and to students of, of color. I, I concur with you. I didn't go get my hair cut. I used to kind of do my hair on my own, but, uh, you know, it was important to go to the, to the stores and to go, um, to the different places, uh, for eating and for food and, um, to go to TSU and to go to, you know, see somebody cross and, and go to step shows and, um, have all of those other parts of, of your experience and your culture that may not happen at Rice, but, um, they certainly do help provide a lot of support for um, our students. And so um, I think Houston is such a huge asset to the university and, um, you know, it seems very normal to us. Right. But I think a lot of um, folks in the rice community don't understand or, or we're not aware how key that additional uh, community support has been for black students at rice over the decades. Yeah. Can I jump the gun on you a little bit to say that actually one of the key parts of my success at Maryland, was we had to create a community, but the, the thing that we found out that was interesting was we recruited some black students to come into the graduate program at Maryland. We thought they're black students, they'll meet each other. They didn't. We were very surprised that we sort of had to give them permission. It's okay, you, you're gonna be a part of a graduate community. You can also be part of a black community. And then once we told them that was okay, they ran with it. I mean, it was, it was not a problem. I was surprised the years after I stepped down as chair, I got an invitation. Somebody was getting ready to do thesis defense. 
And so she sent an email, would y'all please come? I'm gonna do my thesis defense tomorrow and I'd like to rehearse. And I went there and there were like six or seven black students. And I went to the defense the next day and I think the students asked at least as good a question as the faculty asked at the defense. So they built a community, but I did find out that we had to give them permission to build a community. They knew they needed to fit into this white community. That was built, given. They didn't realize that if there are enough of you, you can also build your own community. And when we gave them permission to do that, they did it magnificently. Well, and I will um, want to add before we move on to the, to the next phase of, of questioning that we're, we're on our way to, to having um, a, a larger community of African-American um, PhD um, graduates from the, from, from the math department. Um, um, we, um, we, we have our, our, our first uh, black uh, professor in the math department now, um, Dr. Chelsea Walton. Uh, and there are now two um, black PhD students in, in the department um, who, are, who, are, who are well on their way um, to joining you. Um, Dr. Good, that's Johnson. good to hear. That's very good to hear. So picking up on that a little bit, um, I know that you had a very accomplished career at um, Maryland. Um, I remember one of our first times meeting was uh, when you came back um, to teach at, at Rice and, um, you know, a few years after that, you had received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics and Engineering Mentoring. Um, uh, and you just really had done so much work with not only, um, you know, bringing in students of color to Maryland, but also just mentoring them and supporting them um, in such a tremendous way. I, I recall meeting one of your former students when you uh, received your alumni award here at Rice and the pride on her face and, and, and representing a legacy of Dr. Johnson's uh, students who had, um, you know, completed their, their programs was just, uh, it always stuck with me. And so, you know, can you talk to us about your work at Maryland and how you uh, made sure to have that pipeline of success and, and pathway for other um, students to follow behind you there? So I should say the first thing, my first memory of the University of Maryland, I came in 1968. And as I drove on the campus, the first thing I remember was seeing a whole bunch of George Wallace for President Science. I was not encouraged, but I persevered, and I'd say the secrets of, secret of my success was my failure. So here's what happened. As a young assistant professor, black, they had recruited some black students and they wanted the students to succeed, so they assigned them to me. Now being naive, I accepted the assignment and I worked with the students as best I could. It was a total failure. I mean, they were good students, they were hardworking students, uh, for example, we lost one student to Mary Jane. He decided he, first black student, passed all of his written exams, but decided marijuana was more important than a PhD. And, you know, so it was life. It wasn't mathematics, it was life. But so what, what happened was I worked with the students as best I could. I was able to help them get, make progress. I don't think I got maybe one of them a PhD, you helped one of them get a PhD, but it just wasn't successful. So that failure, what I saw was we hadn't brought the right students to campus. I mean, it's not, it's just, it's not the preparation, it's the preparation and attitude. I mean, that you really think you can succeed, that you know you want it. You're not there as a number, you're there because they really think you can succeed. So. I was lucky, I was made graduate chair. And I also remember my first result as graduate chair was a failure because I had a student who applied. And you know, this is a time when you, you're trying to get black students, but I looked at the record and I said, we can do better than this. So I didn't accept the student. But then when I didn't accept the student, that meant I had to find some that I could accept. 
So I really began trying to recruit students that I felt like fit the profile of people who could succeed in Maryland. And then when I got them there, I learned, as I said, that, you know, just because we had them didn't mean that they felt comfortable talking to each other. So that, that was actually a lesson I learned from a white administrator. Uh, and what happened was we had a professor who was in the break room. Uh, he was talking about how the students we were admitting weren't necessarily that qualified. And so then what happened after was first one black student came into the graduate program administrator's office and said, told her what he said. And then another black student came in and told her the same thing. And so it was clear that they hadn't talked to each other. And she actually came to me and said, you know, we need to make it clear to them that they can talk to each other. So we actually organized a social for all the black students. And then, you know, we kept encouraging them with the idea that you can create a community. And yes, you have to be part of the bigger community because you are part of the graduate program at Maryland, but you also are part of the black graduate program at Maryland. So you can have your own community as well. And I think that was really the key, the fact that they were able to talk to each other and that, that they were able to participate in both communities. You, you mentioned um, c collaborating with um, uh, your, your colleagues and, and administrators at, at the university. Um, and I wonder if you could talk some more about what, what types of support as a as a faculty member at Maryland, as the chair, as a graduate chair at Maryland, and as a department chair at Maryland, what type of um, support from the leadership, from your deans, from your provost, from your president, from the board at Maryland, what, what, what types of support, if any, did you find um, particularly useful? Or, or what kinds of support would you have found most, most useful in your work? So I think that the short answer is no support. I mean, I was very lucky at some point in my life, I met a very wise man named James Rossa, who was the president of Cal State Los Angeles. And one of the things he said was, um, you know, everybody goes after NSF funding. And NSF at that time's budget was $3 billion. He said, but you know, the universities are spending $3 trillion. We should be going after the university. And I learned from that, that the resources are there in the university. And so a lot of the students that we recruited, I recruited with university funds. Now I had help because the chairman of the math department, I mean, the first student I recruited who was really, really good, outstanding from Spelman. And I remember we had this ABC ranking scale, the standard ABC ranking scale. She came back from our graduate committee in the math department rated as a C, a C, she would not get an assistantship. So I went to the chairman, who's white, and I said, Nelson, you know, they got this all wrong. This is one of the best students I've ever seen, and they gave her a C. He said, send it over to the fellowship committee. We have more experience, we have a broader, access to a broader pool, let's see how she does in the fellowship committee. Send it over to the fellowship committee, of course, he's got warning, he knows how good she is. She came back with an A, and so in the math department decided that she was an A and the math department gave her an assistantship. So, I mean, a fellowship, I'm sorry, not an assistantship, a fellowship. I mean, you, you just run into these little things like that all the time. I had another student. So this was a student who was a graduate student from Spelman. Now we've had very good success with Spelman. And here's this graduate student from Spelman who's getting out from Spelman with a degree at the age of 16 in mathematics. She, go, she applies to Maryland, and then she writes me an email and says, you know, um, I really wanted to come to Maryland, but Maryland hasn't given me a very good offer, and Princeton is offering me a fellowship. So I just sent the guy who was in charge of the program, you know, uh, Princeton's giving her a fellowship. All of a sudden, we managed to give her a fellowship. She came, she got a degree. I mean, it's, it's that there's this lack of awareness that you've got to somehow get through to your colleagues. And some of it, the university knows something about, and sometimes university can help. But I guess I felt more that the university was there to say, go do it. And fortunately, we had enough money to do it. 
But, you know, I can imagine that if I was in a department like I don't know, history, where there aren't as many assistantships, maybe that would be a little bit harder to do. Mathematics was relatively rich. We had a number of assistantships, and so we could do it. But, but the university, I mean, one of the things I was very disappointed about was that when I left, you know, we had built a pipeline. We had students who would recommend other students who would, that you should con consider Maryland. You don't have to go to Maryland, but you should consider Maryland. And it just disappeared in about three years because they didn't follow up. No one was interested in using the advantage that we had built up to keep producing graduate, black graduate students. So it's difficult. I mean, the history of mathematics is littered with examples where someone comes along, like me, like Lee Larch at Fisk. Lee Larch was a communist, but you know, he went to Fisk and while he was at Fisk, he had six students going to get PhDs in mathematics, okay? He was a white guy, okay? Six students going to get a PhD in mathematics. None before, none since. Now, that's just because he paid attention and he did the same things. He, you know, he encouraged people. He said, hey, why don't you consider graduate school? Nobody else has done it before or since. It, it's, it's difficult and it's very, very hard work. Thanks, thanks so much for that answer. You, you raised some really interesting points there. I, it makes me encouraged and discouraged all in one because <laughs> I feel like uh, we have those con these conversations so often about how do you make those institutional changes yeah. so that it's not depending on the excellence of one Dr. Johnson or the excellence of one Dr. Bird. I mean, over your you know, career, do you have any you know, sort of ideas about that or how we might have I, I told you I failed at it. I mean, so, you know, <laughs> I guess that's the first thing I said. I mean, in retrospect, I, I, I learned because there was this example of Lee Larch. There was another example. Uh, I've forgotten the, the, the person's name in Michigan who had just built a wonderful program. Lee Larch told me about him, that this guy would get in his station wagon every summer and drive around to all the HBCUs and ask them, who's your best students? And in the 40s, they were producing PhDs at the University of Michigan. Okay, they were graduating in large numbers of PhDs, but then when he died, or when he stopped being graduate chair, nobody continued it, and so all of a sudden you look up, and I was there when Michigan finally decided to get back into the game of recruiting African American students, and then they totally botched it. But you know, this one person had just done it, and Clarence Stevens at Potsdam, Lee Larch at Fisk, I, I can give you so many examples but it is hard to institutionalize unless you have somebody who wants to do it, who's gonna make it a priority. Well, we're gonna to turn to a couple of the questions um, here before we run out of time. I, you do raise a really interesting um, question or highlight uh, about HBCUs. I know you spent a couple of years teaching at Howard and you highlighted how um, there are so many students in your pipeline from, from HBCUs. Um, you know, what impact do you think that has had on, um, you know, that pipeline that you're talking about, the importance of HBCUs um, and that, that story as well? Okay, so I, I think the, 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 the key for me was I learned, you know, I did not know when I started the process, but one of the things I learned was that the culture at an HBCU is very different than the culture at a place like Maryland. And in fact, I well remember one of my students telling me, you know, she, she came in and we we're talking about African-American students. She said, look, we don't need special rules. We just want to know what the rules are. And, and, and at an HBCU, the rule is try to bring everybody along. At a place like Maryland, the rule is we're going on to the next class and either you're going to make it or you aren't going to make it. And so getting the students to understand, okay, and when, once they understood, they were willing to do the work and they were able to do the work. It's just that they come in with an, from HBCU thinking everybody's going to get be carried along and everybody's going to be helped and we're all going to be, you know, get this assistance. And then they find out it's not true. And, and some of them can be lost at that point. So we tried to explain and the other students explained when they came, as the students came in, how it was going to be different at Maryland than it had been at an HBCU. And I think that helped the students quite a bit. Uh, 
you, you don't get a pipeline, but you know, if you do well, then students will recommend to people consider your school. And so at least you get looked at. Whereas a lot of times you, you might not even be considered when people are considering whether or not they're gonna to come to graduate school at your place. But we did get the point where students were willing to consider us because we had a record of success. It's, it's interesting that you bring that up, especially in the area of STEM, because you hear about that, you know, mentality um, at an HBCU, perhaps it's different from, you know, a, a PWI or a large state school. You think about schools like Prairie View and North Carolina A&T and how much success they've had with engineering for Black students or, you know, Morehouse and Xavier when it comes to, to medicine. And, and I think that's really something important to for all of us to consider and look at. Um, that approach to, yes, we're bringing everybody along because it, it does matter um, how that yields greater success, perhaps, um, than just the, you know, you make it, you don't, so what, on to the next. Um, you know, that's not. And you have to understand the downside of that. The downside of bringing everybody along is, and this, I had a colleague who had great frustration with this. I mean, but, you know, I think you can manage it, but it is a downside. The downside is that, you know, you, you may end up teaching two thirds of the syllabus to make sure that everybody understands the whole course and passes it. But then when you go to the next course, you're missing one third of what you need for the next course. And so that's the, the balance that has to be struck. And, and I don't think we get it right at the predominantly white institutions. I think we're probably a little bit too cavalier because there's always another student, but you know, you do have to make sure somehow that you cover enough of the material that you don't put them at a disadvantage when they go into the next class. Right, right. And that actually, um, you know, kind of lends itself to one of the questions we have in our Q and A, which is, did you ever consider attending an HBCU instead of UT and Rice? <laughs> I hate to say this, but I probably didn't even know what an HBCU was when I graduated from high school. I was lucky to hear about college, because again, no one in my family had ever gone to college. So I'm afraid my knowledge of the world was extremely limited when I left Alice. So the answer is no, but only because I didn't know of any. Well, doc, doc, Dr. Walton, who we've, um, um, I've introduced a little earlier, has a, a question. First, she wants to- Yeah, I, I know her. I have met her at least once. And she, she wants to, you, you know, when you talked about how difficult it is to building a pipeline is one thing, maintaining a pipeline yeah. is, a, is another thing. And, and you spoke briefly about th that in some ways you felt you had, you had failed because, maintain, because the pipeline wasn't maintained. And, and of, of course, she wants, to, she wants to chime in with the, with the comment that um, you certainly did, did not fail at this um, when, when she looks back. At, at, at her career and the, the ways in which um, her professional development interacts and intersects with the development of, 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 of students that you produced and helped produce at, at Maryland. And, and they've really helped her as peer mentors, um, which, which also leads to a, a, a question from, from her um, that, that I think um, comes from your, your mention of how successful y'all seem to have been at Maryland with Spellman. Um, she wants to know your thoughts on collaborative mentoring across institutions uh, in, in graduate school, I, 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 I think. We didn't have any money to do anything like that, but I think it can be very valuable in the sense that, you know, the students, the issue is connection, okay? I mean, when you have a Maryland and you've got 10 students, then they can build connections among themselves. I mean, they can, they can talk to each other. They can, you know, they'll, they'll find a community. They'll do all that kind of thing. But what if you have one student? It's very difficult. And the student is alone, isolated. And so if they had a way to keep in contact with their mentors at their previous school, I mean, I think that's a good idea. I know Michigan wanted to try to do that when they tried the second time, uh, but you know things didn't go so well for Michigan the second time. And so I don't know if they managed to get anything like that going. It's a good idea. It's expensive perhaps, and not so easy. I mean, you can do it with email, but the question is, you know, is that really a good 
kind of mentoring arrangement when you're you just you know on the other end of an email chain. We uh, previously talked a little bit about you know referring to the first at Rice in more of a collective sense, um, and you know so we talk about obviously you um, Charles Freeman and Jacqueline McCauley, uh, Velma McAfee. Williams, Ted Henderson, and, and Linda Faye Williams. And we, we have a question from our audience that wants to know, uh, were you at Maryland around the same time as uh, Linda Faye Williams? And did you have the opportunity to um, meet her and, and talk with her at all, either at Maryland or at some sort of activity back at Rice? Can I say that was one of the great regrets of my life? So yes, I did meet Linda when she was a faculty member at the University of Maryland. And we realized we had both graduated from Rice. And so we were trying to arrange to have lunch together. And of course, I did not know at the time that she was ill, but you know, we kept having to get postponements because uh, she would cancel typically. And the last time we had scheduled the meeting, I remember it so well because usually I come into the office and then go to the union where I was supposed to meet her. But this time I was running late so I went straight to the union for a meeting with her at 11 o'clock and she wasn't there. So I waited a few minutes and I went back to my office and she had called and she had had to cancel. And it turns out that was when she went in the hospital for the last time. So I really never did get to sit one-on-one -on -one with her. I did get to meet her, you know, in a, one of these faculty meeting greets for faculty of color at the University of Maryland. And we tried to arrange an individual sit down, but we never quite got to do it because of her illness. We're approaching the end, so we want to make a last call for um, questions. Um, so get, get, get a question in if you've been, if, 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 if you've been waiting and, and we will we'll get it to you. We'll um, pose it to, to Dr. Johnson. Um, and as, as we wait, but before we start winding up, I, I do want to uh, allow the opportunity um, for Dr. Johnson to, to say anything um, about his experience that he, 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 he perhaps wishes that we had elicited with a question, but, but, but didn't, well, if there's okay, something yeah, you want I, to I share. won't do that, but, but I guess I had thought about this whole question in the context of Willie's statue. And so the question that I had in my mind was, what was my relationship with Willie's statue? And I have to say, it, it didn't exist, okay? I mean, the math department was in Anderson Hall when I was there, which is right across from the statue. I don't think I ever thought about the statue, okay? But after I graduated, I learned the story about William March Rice and how he had been murdered uh, by the butler. So that was kind of fascinating. And then I remember I heard the story about the students turning the statue so when I came back to campus in 1993 with my son who was taking the pictures, he actually took some pictures of me in front of the statue. But that was the first time I really, I didn't have any awareness of the statue until I left campus. I knew it was there. I think that that may actually tie into sort of the last two questions we have. Um, well, first and foremost, I don't, I don't know if you know if anyone from Alice ever attended Rice. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you've heard of that. Uh, I don't know of anyone from Alice who attended Rice. I do know that there was a Rice a high school graduate who got his PhD from Yale shortly before I went off to Rice. That's all I know. And as I mentioned, Jim Allison, who got his high school degree in Rice, won a Nobel Prize in medicine. I knew his brother. His brother was a classmate of mine, but I did not know Jim Allison. So I think I can combine uh, yeah. sort of the last two questions that have come in, which are just, you know, given your, your many, many years of experience at Rice and with the Rice community, um, would you recommend Rice to um, other African-American students or, or do you have any thoughts in general just about ways in which white rice can continue to um, improve for students of color? So, you know, again, I was in a very unusual position in the sense of being basically 
alone and no no other supporting network around me in that sense. But I guess my feeling is my experience at Rice was so good. I, I met my wife there. I still have contacts with almost all of my classmates. I mean, I, I know many of the classmates I've seen. Jeff Lewis, uh, who the announcers for wheelchair basketball. I saw him a couple of years ago when I was in Houston, when my good friend CC2 died. I contacted a lot of the classmates and my son went up to the funeral and, uh, you know, read the sentiments from the classmates. So I think I had such a wonderful experience at Rice that I really have to recommend it very highly for anybody else. Even though it was only me, it was just such a nice welcoming environment. And I hope that Rice still try, stri uh, strive to produce the same kind of welcoming environment for undergraduate students, particularly students of color. I, I don't know if one of our um, participants has a specific question um, about um, a, a group of black student demands that, that were issued last year. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but, but if you are, um, the participant want, wanted to know your, your, your thoughts on those. No, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with it. You know, um, I think I, I told you when we were first talking about this that I have a very conflicted relationship with William Marsh Rice because I did learn about the fact that, you know, we own slaves and things like that. I've watched a couple of the doc talks and I've watched some of the discussion. Uh, but I just really have not kept up with what the demands were. So I guess I don't think I feel confident to answer it. Right, right now, Akila and I are doing that thing where we're not in the same room, but we're trying to look at each other and read each other's eyes to see how much time we have left and what, <laughs> whether it's time to round up, uh, wind up. And I, I, I think it's probably time to wind. There you go. Okay, I think okay. it's, we reached the, the time in Zoom where okay. we, we'll just give hand signals. We'll just come straight out. Um, so Dr. Johnson, it, uh, again, just a great honor um, to, to spend this um, time with you. We really appreciate your, your continuing to come back to Rice and, and, and to give to Rice um, in the manifold ways that, that, that you have and, and are. Um, so um, please accept the, the, the thanks of our entire um, community um, for, for, for um, taking a, a large step in opening up this university um, so that um, Rice could, could begin to, to, to take steps toward achieving its greatest um, potential. And, and while doing that also to help students um, to do the same and, 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 and to never see that, that journey as um, completed, but, but um, to continuously rededicate our, ourselves to it and, and hearing from you and, and hearing your story um, is just a powerful reminder of why we must be committed um, to, to, to this work. Thank you. I mean, I, I really owe a lot to Rice and in particular to the classmates who, you know, accepted me at Rice and made it much easier than it could have been under, under, under other circumstances. So, so, so to our attendees, I want to thank you, all of you for joining us as, as well. Um, this is not quite the end of our programming for the semester. We have one more event um, for 2020, and that will take place on Friday, December 4th at, at 12 p.m. Central Time, um, where we'll have our last doc talk of the year. Uh, and that's where Dr. McDaniel and I discuss um, research from the task force. And on Friday, um, you, should, you should really come. You, you should set an alarm now on your iPhone for Friday um, because we'll be hearing from a group of student researchers with the university's racial geography project um, from a unit of that project, project that is focused on the land, land and labor um, at the university. Um, so please tune in to that. Um, it's a live webinar. As I've said, it starts at 12 p.m. noon central time. Uh, and to get the link um, to that webinar, um, please just go to our website, um, which is taskforce.rice.edu. 
That's taskforce.rice.edu. Um, and we'll also over the break um, be um, uploading a few more um, episodes of our Doc Talk podcast, um, which are based on um, those webinars. So if you don't have time to visit with us on Fridays at noon, you can just go to the task force website and get the links to those um, webinars as they're um, produced as podcasts, but with added value um, because Kate Colley from the Association of Rice Alumni um, joins us in those podcasts to debrief the, the week's conversation. Um, thanks so much for all of you who have um, come tonight and, and who have um, been with us on this, this journey, um, the public part of our journey um, this year. Uh, I think Akila told me I was closing, but I think, and that's part of the close, um, but I'll pitch it back to her um, to really close us um, out for the evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bird. Uh, that is not what we agreed to, but it's okay. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but again, thank you all so much for attending and please, please continue to, to keep going to the task force website. There are um, so many resources there, not only recordings of these sessions and the podcast that Dr. Bird um, it just talked about, but also uh, a lot of the uh, historical information that our students and faculty researchers are putting together uh, relating to these topics. They're being documented there. They're being linked there all from that same website. So please, please continue to follow that um, over the next several months. And again, thank you all so much for attending. And um, after you attend the Doc Talks on Friday, please have a, a happy and safe holiday season. Thank you all.